Pastor Jim, thank you so much for being on this video today because there's so many unbiblical uh, misconceptions about spiritual warfare. And I know when I was first saved, I was going through spiritual warfare. The demons were obviously very unhappy that I had left the New Age and was now talking about them openly. And I didn't know what to do. So I went to a deliverance ministry. I actually hired someone. It was very expensive to hold a cross to me and exercise some witch he said was in me. And, and I would listen to discernment uh, videos that would cast out demons and such, but it seemed like it just made it worse. And reading your book, Truth or Territory, really explained why all of those efforts didn't work. So uh, I wonder if you could help us out today, because there's so much spiritual warfare lingo in the Christian community that is not based in the Bible, is it? No, it's not. Uh, much of it's based on the testimony of demons or experience or uh, much of it is based on a twisting of certain scripture passages and Bible references. Uh, a lot of the modern spiritual warfare methodology is nothing more than a man-made methodology that uh, looks like something that uh, you would find in a Harry Potter novel, but has been baptized in Christian lingo. It's, it's more akin to what you would find in a Frank Peretti novel than anything you find in scripture. Oh my goodness. Well, there, there we begin. <laughs> so these deliverance ministries that you see, like I, I went to a deliverance minister, um, do you see any value in it or do they actually, can they create harm for a Christian? Uh, I think they do more harm than good, more harm than good because they, they end up taking people away from uh, the true scriptural uh, teaching on biblical spiritual warfare, and they distract people's attention from where it needs to be. And, and it ends up communicating an entirely wrong view of what spiritual warfare is. Spiritual warfare is not us doing hand-to-hand -hand combat with demons. Spiritual warfare is us advancing the truth. And, and thus the title of the book, it's a battle for the truth, not a battle over physical territory um, that we wage with uh, incantations and prayer mantras and different methodologies in order to fight back the forces of darkness. That's the territorial view of spiritual warfare. And I believe scripture teaches a, that spiritual warfare, true biblical spiritual warfare, is a battle for the truth. We are to advance the truth and the kingdom of God and his truth and proclaim that against the forces of darkness uh, just by doing what we're doing right now, explaining the truth, advancing God's word and, and treating God's word clearly and, and preaching the gospel. That's real true biblical spiritual warfare. Deliverance ministries take people's attention and focus off of that and place it on uh, the demonic and the satanic and it ends up blaming Satan and demons for sin, for generational curses, for uh, inability to have victory over sin and be sanctified, etc. And that's that's really not what uh, biblical spiritual warfare is. So I think that I think they're harmful ministries. Mm -hmm. uh, may, some of them may be well intentioned. I don't know, but I definitely believe that they're misguided and off base. Well, in my experience, it made it worse, and it reminded me of Jesus talking about the demon being cast out of a person, and then the demon went and got seven of its demon friends and brought it back in. And that was my experience; is it just worsened everything the more that I tried to do rebuking and and uh, and and repenting for generational curses and and praying a hedge around myself and and the the trouble was because I was a neophyte to the Bible, I, I could see in Job that there was a hedge. You know, I could see I could see yep. that um Jesus had in, empowered the disciples to go cast out demons. And so there was just enough biblical truth in there to make me feel comfortable. Yep. But it's twisting the scripture, isn't it? It is. Uh, the reference to hedges, you know, that's a twisting of scripture. In, in the book, I have a whole chapter on, on that and the me that methodology and whether or not it's actually biblical. People will see in scripture references to hedges and thorns, and then they think that that is a biblical mandate, a spiritual mandate for praying a hedge of thorns. And then that type of language gets worked into the Christian vernacular and it gets passed on and you hear pastors praying it from behind the pulpit and people in prayer meetings praying it and Sunday school classes praying it. And, and it becomes something that we do almost without questioning, is this really biblical? And what, what, are, what do I think that this is accomplishing when I do this? I liked how in your book you said that it was no more effective than planting uh, a, a hedge of tomato plants around yourself. Right. Like and, praying a, a hedge of tomato plants. Yeah. <laughs> I was laughing about yeah. that. Yeah. It's uh, it, 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 because it's a man-made system, it's a man-made uh, ideology um, that we were, when we're praying something like that, it's part of a man-made idea of what spiritual warfare is. 
Um, why not pray against tomato plants? What if we had the testimony from a demon that Satan hates tomatoes? Then maybe we could pray a hedge of tomato plants around us and it would be more effective than praying a hedge of thorns. Um, I guess when you, when you think about it, um, some hedge is not going to stop a demon. No, and, and what, people, what people are using that phraseology to describe is what they're asking for is God's protection. And they're asking, what that, that's really what they're going after. But, but they use the phraseology as if when I pray this, it erects in the spiritual realm some sort of a hedge of protection. And they're really asking for God's protection. And I'm not, I don't, I don't take issue with praying for God's protection. Right. I, I pray for God's protection when I travel or at night or for my children or for my kids when they're traveling or, or a number of different things. But if I think that by uttering the, the phrase, I pray a hedge of thorns, that suddenly in the spiritual realm, this, my words create some sort of a spiritual barrier that protects me from Satan, then I have a, then I have a warped and man-made view of spiritual warfare. What I really need to pray for is that God would sovereignly protect me or that he would order the affairs of his providence to, to protect me or to guide, guard me, guard me from harm. Those are all biblical prayers, but we ought not to think that by saying I cancel this or I pray this in the name of Jesus, that we are affecting by in the spiritual realm, by our words, some sort of reality. It's, it's, it's almost like a spiritualized word of faith movement that I speak something yeah. into existence and I create this reality in the spiritual realm by the words that I say. Yeah, so it's making a man-centered theology yes. instead of God's sovereign nature. Right. You guys have got to get this book, Truth or Territory. I mean, oh, the link's in the description. Thank um, you. Yeah, no, it, it, it's almost like you were watching me after my salvation, <laughs> Pastor Jim, because- Well, I, 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 I was describing me after my salvation. Oh. When I first got saved, I, I didn't know very much about scripture at all, and I wasn't well discipled. I ended up going to Bible college where I was exposed to all kinds of, of Christianized nonsense. And, you know, you're, you're, I might have been getting good, good theology and good teaching in the classroom, but in the dorm room was an, an entirely different thing. You'd sit around and listen to college students talk about uh, stuff that they were exposed to or things that they were doing. And one college student, well-meaning as he was, handed me a tape where the man on the tape was teaching through how to, how to lead anybody to Christ. And I have a lot of family and friends that are, are not believers in Christ. And so I, th I thought I needed this, I thought I needed this formula. So I listened to the tape and it talked about praying a hedge of thorns and canceling generational curses and binding Satan and then praying for salvation. And it had this formula that, that uh, they recommended. And so I got involved in all of that stuff, thinking that by doing this, I was going to become more sanctified and more holy and resist temptation and free my relatives and cancel all the generational curses. My, my father was a, an adulterating drunkard who left me when I was three years old. And I thought, well, who knows what kind of generational curses are on his side of the family that are affecting me and what kind of demons are attached to me and, and my lineage. And I was looking at starting a family before too long, and I wanted to have my family free of that. So I got all wrapped, everything I criti criti critique in the book, I got all wrapped up into that. And uh, until I was kind of finally set free from it, I came to a biblical understanding of spiritual warfare. And so my writing of this book is something of a mea culpa for all of my nonsense that I was involved in. Oh, I love that. It, it reads that way. It reads of someone who's had these experiences. Can we yeah, talk I've done about it. I, I've read it. I've read the books. I've you know watched the sessions and listened to the tapes, and, and I was involved in it. This is not just armchair philosophy. This is someone who's been, been there, done that. Can we talk about generational curses? Because, I mean, it, it does, is it in Exodus that God says that he, the sins of the forefather will be visited on the present right. generation? And so you think ipso facto, that means that, like you were talking about with your father, and, and I come from this long line of Christian scientists, heretics, and, and so you think, well, God's going to punish us for what right. our ancestors did. Yeah, the, there's a corrective to that misuse of the passage in Ezekiel, where Ezekiel talks about uh, the, the sons will not be punished for their father's sins, and the fathers will not be punished for their son's sins. And he goes through, Ezekiel the prophet goes through this long scenario where a righteous father has a wicked son, and so he asks the question, would, it, would the Lord punish the father for the sins of the, of the wicked son, or would the wickedness of the son be excused because his father was righteous? And of course not. And, he, and he, he, he reverses that too. You know, then that wicked son has another son who's righteous. Will that righteous son or the grandson of the original righteous person, will he be punished for the wickedness of his father? Ezekiel says, of course not. Everybody will be punished for their own sin. And then Ezekiel says, is this, this is what is right and just, that every man will bear responsibility for his own sin. And yet 
those in the nation of Israel were saying, well, that's not right that God would, that God would not punish uh, our children for our sins. And that's the corrective to the abuse of the passage. So that brings us back to the passage in Exodus. What does the passage in Exodus talk about when it says that um, God will punish the sins of the fathers and the children of the third and fourth generation? There's two things going on there. One, that um, God is saying, the, the assumption behind that verse is, and, and the context would bear this out, that the children continue in the sins of their fathers. That's the idea, that if I am an idolater and I walk away from Yahweh as my God and my child follows suit, and his child follows suit, and his child follows suit, God is going to punish that iniquity that I started and that I began on my children as long as each generation successfully follows in the footsteps of their father. But the corrective from Ezekiel 18, if, my, if, I, if I'm a, uh, an apostate from the true God of Israel, and I'm speaking here as if I were a Jew reading the book of Exodus, if I'm an apostate from the true God of Israel, then and, and my son turns from that wickedness and is a believer in the true God of Israel, God is not going to punish that sin, that my sin upon my son. That would be number one unjust, and mm -hmm. it would be a violation of that principle that uh, the Lord spells out in Ezekiel. My son would be blessed for his righteousness, for his faith. I would be cursed for my wickedness. But if my son continues in my sin, then uh, he, of course, he would be punished, and and so that would go to the third or the fourth generation. And then the other part of that verse where uh, in, his, in Exodus, the Lord says, but the righteous, I will bless them to the thousandth generation. There's sort of a, a Hebrew parallelism going on there where the Lord says, I will punish sins of the fathers um, on the children who continue in that disobedience to the mm -hmm. third and the fourth generation. But the Lord says, I would much rather pour out blessings for on a thousand faithful generations than mm -hmm. curse three or four wicked generations. The desire of God is to bless the righteous a thousand times more than his desire is to punish the wicked. That makes sense. And, and you really see that with the generations of the kings in Second Kings yeah. and yeah. Chronicle. Right. And, yeah. And God is just to treat each according to their own deeds. And that's right. the principle of scripture. Um, you know, in Ezekiel's day, they had a proverb, the fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, meaning that the, the father does one thing and it's the children who suffer the consequences of it. And uh, Ezekiel says, this is not, you know, you say this proverb, he says this to the Jews of his day. Ezekiel says, you, you say this proverb, but that's not right or just. And you have it backwards and God has it right. God will visit and deal with each person according to his own deeds. Mm -hmm. That would be the right and just thing to do. So the idea that there are generational curses, and in the book, I, in, I have a whole chapter on that in the book. I spell out a ton of problems with this, dealing, of course, with the passages that talk about disposed generational curses but also talking about how this is abused in many sp modern spiritual war warfare circles. Mm -hmm. You know, they will, the spiritual warfare experts talk about uh, if you're a Christian and you adopt a child from say Jamaica or uh, Haiti, you don't know what type of generational curses are on that child and what type of demonic influence they're going to bring into your home. So you have to plead the blood of Jesus and go through all the mantras and the formulas in order to cancel the curses and plead the blood of Jesus, Jesus over him, cast out the demons and, that's just a horrible spiritual burden to place onto mm -hmm. people and, and especially to view adopted children in that way yeah. as if they have some unique special connection to the demonic because of what their ancestors did. Yeah. That is that, a view that's, of demonic I was surprised when I read that in your book. because unbiblical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could discourage people from adopting is unfortunate. Yeah. And, and then also, you know, it ends up blaming you say you get a, a child that is adopted and, and they don't, they're not, don't immediately become believers or they don't become uh they don't immediately adopt our God or they don't, or they become disobedient or rebellious in some way. Then of course the temptation is to blame it on some yeah. sort of a generational curse, some sort of a hex on their bloodline. Uh, and that's some of the language that spiritual warfare experts use. And it's just a completely, uh, it's a patently unbiblical view of, of demons and, and how, and, and how they influence us. Could it be spiritually dangerous to be pleading these unbiblical prayers? I mean, could it open you up for, further demonic oppression? Uh, I don't know if it could open you up to de demonic oppression. I think the idea behind unbiblical prayers is that we are praying for something that is unnecessary or that God has not commanded us to pray. Mm -hmm. uh, in that situation, uh, praying against it, there's, there's no such thing as a bloodline curse. This is something fabricated by spiritual warfare experts, and scripture does not teach anything akin to a bloodline curse or a generational hex that's on a bloodline for some sin that my great, great, great grandfather did. Um, that, that's not biblical at all. Um, the God's curse would rest upon me if I were to duplicate or continue to walk in the footsteps of my grandfather and my mm -hmm. father. Uh, 
right. and continue in their sin, then of course I would receive the same uh, punishments or curses that would fall upon me for my continuance in their sin. But the answer for that sinful pattern of ancestry and, and fathers and children and grandfathers, etc., the biblical answer to that is the gospel. And the gospel sets us free from that. When we're translated out of the kingdom of darkness and put into the kingdom of light of God's dear son, there is no condemnation to us. There's no bloodline. There's no curse. We don't have any lingering uh, satanic dirt that, that rests upon us that we need to, you know, get purged off of us or anything like that. So what would you say to someone who is going through a season of spiritual warfare right now, Pastor Jim? Um, I, I work with a lot of people who are new Christians. They're just fresh out of the new age. And it's like all hell is breaking loose in their house. They're not sleeping. There's uh, poltergeist things happening. What can a person do that is biblical? In a situation like that, somebody comes out of a background like that. It's akin to somebody coming out of a pagan background that mm -hmm. Paul would have encountered on his travels. Um, the answer to all of that, you know, you read through Paul's epistles, they're written to Gentile Christians who had come out of idolatry, like the Colossians and the Ephesians, and, and some of them who had come out of uh, rampant sexual immorality, like the Corinthians. And Paul doesn't talk about binding Satan or loosening no. demons or generational curses or hexes or any of that stuff. Uh, what Paul talks about is being sanctified and learning to walk in the truth, having our mind conformed by the word of God. Somebody who comes out of a spiritual new age background, their their biggest need is just to immerse themselves in scripture and read and think and absorb and memorize and hear good teaching, get in a sound church, get under sound leadership, start being discipled, read every good book that you can, plunge yourself in to the deep things of God's word as quickly as you possibly can and start to have your mind renewed and and pray to the Lord that he would set you free, that he would open your eyes. Um, that's really what they need. They need to be sanctified by the truth. It's not a, and, and that is spiritual warfare, that it is a battle against the world, the flesh, mm -hmm. and the devil. And the devil is a defeated foe. And we have worldliness all around us that's trying to make us think like and act like the world. And then we have a flesh, which is the enemy within, which is trying to undo us and destroy us at every turn. And there's, there's no magic secret to any of that. It's the renewing of the mind, the sanctifying work of the Spirit of God, the, the truth in the life and the heart of a believer, and walking in obedience. It's mortifying, putting to death sin in my members, and yielding my members as instruments of righteousness, and saying no to sin, and saying no to, to wickedness and immorality, and, and just walking in the truth and immersing myself in Scripture. That That is going to set somebody free, and, and don't... Mm -hmm. I, that's not going to... Not only is there no magic formula, there's no secret pill that makes it go away. Right. All. And this is what the bogus spiritual warfare movement offers is a magic formula. Mm -hmm. If you cancel the curse and you pray this and you put on the armor of God in this way, then all of a sudden you'll be sanctified and you'll have victory over sin. It's not that easy. There may be sins or bad thinking that some of us will struggle with for the rest of our lives. And we need to be prepared to simply do battle with that and to fight it and to mortify it uh, until the Lord calls us home. And, you know, we're going we're to have increasing victory over sin and worldliness and temptation as we grow in the Lord and grow older. But we need to be prepared that there may be battles that we do against certain sins that are our, our Achilles heel, as mm -hmm. it were, and that those sins are going to be with us and they're going to haunt us and they're going to be there forever. Uh, not forever, but I mean, until I go home to be with the Lord That's right. in this life, I'm not going to ever be able to lay down my sword against that enemy. Mm -hmm. Some enemies we will be able to vanquish. Some enemies we won't. And for every person, that's going to be different. For somebody who comes out of a new age background, the, the, the struggle may be to think rightly about God and his kingdom and, and his word or um, about other people or about the demonic. They're going to fight that. For somebody who comes out of a, an immoral background, they're going to have to fight the battle of the mind. And that battle, they may never be able to lay down the sword against that enemy. And they just have to be prepared to do that. There's no secret formula. There's mm -hmm. no magic recipe. There's no quick fix. Uh, sanctification is a is a dirty, dusty, miserable road all the way till we go home to be with the Lord, and we need to be ready to walk it. That's part of the call of the gospel. That's so helpful, and I love how you say immerse yourself in Scripture. and And for people who are brand new to the Bible, um, you're talking about daily Bible study, daily Bible reading. My husband yeah. and I found um, partly because we were studying when we were going through so much spiritual warfare. We were studying Jesus in the wilderness, the temptation of Jesus, and how. He approached the devil with, it is written, it is written. And so he yeah. 
he um he he went to the word the devil knew the bible <laughs> yeah. but so my husband and i started playing audios of the bible as we were falling asleep and we've continued that we, we listen to a book of the bible every night and it, it just seems like it helps us to sleep peacefully the house seems peaceful what would you say yeah. to something like that uh, i i have recommended i have articles on my website in fact at the beginning of this year i i start i, I post a sorry i should say i published an article in our church newsletter about uh, tips for reading through the Bible in a year. Uh -huh. um, I commend to our congregation on a regular basis. If you are not in the habit of reading through the Bible once a year, you should start it. You're yes. not going to read. You're not going to understand everything that you read. Every time you read it, you're going to get into Chronicles and and Ezekiel and mm -hmm. Jeremiah, and you're not going to understand where uh, Jabesh Gilead is or any of that stuff. You're not, yes. not going to know those things. A lot of it's not going to make sense, but read it anyway, mm -hmm. um, and, and read through it consistently, and have a consistent Bible reading. I. I have five days out of the week. I do this every year. I've done it every year for 25 years. So I've been through the Bible 25 times. That's just my mm -hmm. yearly reading. And then, of course, I'm studying and preparing messages and doing other readings on top of that. But uh, if I knew that the Lord was going to come back tomorrow, I would still wake up tomorrow morning and read my five chapters or six chapters tomorrow morning because it is the most spiritually productive discipline I have ever adopted in my spiritual life. Bar none. There is no close second. And um, if I knew that the Lord wasn't going to come back for another 25 years, I would look forward to reading through the Bible 25 more times. Yes. And I hope to do it every year until I die. And, and I encourage people to do it because it is, it is so fruitful. And like I say, you're not going to understand everything mm -hmm. on a deep level, but you'll understand some things. And next year when you go through it, you'll understand even more. And then the next year when you go through it even more, and it will continue to grow. And pretty soon you'll find yourself remembering these things that you did not understand 10 years ago and suddenly you're reading through it and not only do you understand it you're able to recall it and yes. that doesn't come just by by uh listening to an occasional sermon or mm -hmm. reading a verse in a daily bread it comes through saturating yourself with scripture and just reading the word of god i i have a man in my congregation who could barely read i think he dropped out of school when he was seven years old when he got or sorry in seventh grade he dropped out of school when he was in seventh grade and then he got saved and he taught himself to read by reading the Bible. He oh, just wow. barely understood the idea of, of phrases and, and, and phonics and such. And that was his diet for years. He oh. just read scripture, forced himself to read it. And uh, he's, he's just a, a godly, gentle, uh, he's a man I want to be like when I grow up. And uh, he taught himself how to read, and he did that using scripture. He understood the value of it. And the, the evidence in his life is his testimony to the value of just reading scripture every day. Oh man, I do. And listening to it is excellent. I mean, you know, there's Bible apps that will read you the Bible while you're yes. doing dishes or mowing the lawn or on a walk or a jog or whatever. And if if finding time to do that is a struggle for you, then I recommend a Bible app or a, a you know, they don't do Bible on cassette anymore, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. yep. You can get mm -hmm. we'll read the whole thing for you. Uh, there's do that and read if you can. Uh, That's what I have I a lady do. It's in a our combination. church this year. Yeah, I have a lady in our church who this year kind of took my challenge to read through the Bible in a year. And she's just been listening to the Bible and she's like halfway through the old Testament and uh, almost all the way through the new Testament now nice. with her by listening to the Bible, just because she listens to it all the way to, to work in the morning. She's got like a 40 minute drive to work and she listens to it every morning and every night on the way home. And she said, I'm actually looking forward to hearing it in probably three or four different translations over the course of this whole year by the time Beautiful. she's done. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Study the original so that you will recognize the counterfeits. I preach out of the NASB. I, I love the ESV as well. Yeah. Uh, probably if I were in the game of switching Bible translations, I would go to the ESV if I were to pick a new one today. But I've been in the NASB for 25 years. I'm just going to stay there. Um, and then I like John MacArthur's study mm -hmm. Bible notes. I've read some study notes in the uh, as R.C. Sproul's or the Reformation yeah, study. Yeah, that's the one I use. I think uh -huh. a lot of that is good. Uh -huh. um, so I'm, I'm more MacArthur in my uh, yeah. eschatology and my perspective. So I recommend that study Bible, but I, I don't think that the other side is heresy. So okay, <laughs> those would yeah, be good. John MacArthur study Bible. I, I bought it because it's got all the parallel references. Yeah. The margins. I just love that. Yeah. So you're reading something and it'll connect you to another part of the Bible. And, and he tackles some of the difficult passages that are a little difficult to interpret in their context. And mm -hmm. with somebody who has 50 years of preaching through the text of scripture, he does a very fine job of sometimes resolving difficulties or explaining challenging texts for us uh, to understand. Yes, he does. I love that recommendation. Thank you for those who are yeah. brand new to the Bible and, and they're reading through the book of numbers and they're confused and upset by what they're reading. It's comforting to be able to drop to the bottom of the page of the Bible and, 
and get an explanation from a theologian. Yeah. Love it. Well, let's talk more about the false teachings from deliverance ministries. Um, you had mentioned binding Satan and binding demons. That's something that's just sprinkled into prayers so frequently these days. Yeah. And it, you, you, it's not like you have to go to a deliverance ministry to hear people pray that. Um, you used to have a dear old man in our congregation that would meet, we'd meet with the elders for prayer before every service. And every once in a while, he would just you know, bind the devil from interfering in this service. And I'd kind of always cringe when I heard him say it. And uh, he's since gone on to be with the Lord and he realizes he shouldn't be doing that, shouldn't have been doing that. But um, it is, it's something that you would get in Baptist churches, a lot of conservative churches. You don't even have to get into charismatic churches uh, that have really bad views of, of spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. It's kind of something that's just in the vernacular it of is. Christianity. And again, it's one of these, it's, it's one of these, man-made ideas that by saying I bind you Satan in the name of Jesus or I bind Satan by the blood of Jesus or Lord bind the devil that all of a sudden God is handcuffing Satan to, to something in the heavenlies and he's not able to affect or influence our church service or our house or our building or our family or, or our event or whatever it is and it's it's an abuse of scripture there's three passages where Jesus talks about um, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in the heavens mm -hmm. And in those three passages in, uh, let me see, is it two of them? One of them, he's talking about the um, church discipline, the structure of church discipline. And uh, in another one, he uses it as Jesus uses the binding of the strong man before he plunders his house as an illustration of his own messianic credentials and claims. Jesus basically saying, if I did not have power over Satan, then I wouldn't be the Messiah. The Messiah has to be somebody who has the ability to exercise power over Satan and his, and his hordes. And Jesus was using his ability to basically plunder Satan's kingdom as evidence of his messianic claims. It has nothing to do with spiritual warfare or anything we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And neither does the reference to whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven uh, in the context of church discipline in Matthew 18. Uh, that's just a reference to um, us announcing on earth what has already been decreed in heaven concerning this situation in which we are exercising authority as, as Christ's church to uh, exclude those who claim to be believers but continue in perpetual and habitual sin. So those yeah. references to binding the strong man, there's, there's no prayers like that in scripture uttered by the apostles anywhere in Acts or the epistles. We're not commanded to do it anywhere in the epistles. And the only references to it have nothing to do with the spiritual warfare at all. It's not even in the context. Again, it's, it's mm -hmm. grabbing a phrase like hedge of thorns or yeah. um, generational curses and, and lifting it from its context and applying it in a way that the authors would have never intended. It's a completely unbiblical practice. Speaking of the disciples, Jesus does empower them to travel and to cast out unclean spirits. And so does that apply to us as well? Um, Jesus did give power and authority to his disciples on some occasions in the gospels to, to do that, uh, mm -hmm. to the 70, for instance, and then mm -hmm. to the 12, and I think another occasion. After Jesus left, he told them that they would do, be doing those works. And then the 12 apostles and, and Paul, as a 13th one, had the ability to perform signs as Jesus did in order to authenticate the message, which is exactly what Jesus assigns uh, accomplished was authenticating him as a messenger from God. He, he says this in John chapter five. He said, if you don't believe my words, believe the works that I do. The works that I do give evidence of the fact that I speak for God. And he pointed to his miracles as proof of his divine claims. And in the, in the book of Acts, we see the exact same thing. The, the miracles in the book of Acts serve to authenticate the message that Paul and Barnabas preached. And Paul cites that in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem council, he talks about his gospel and then he gave testimony to the fact that God was confirming his gospel of grace alone, your faith alone and Christ alone by giving him the ability to perform wonders amongst the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So in the book of Acts in the new Testament, we see two things that number one, Jesus did give power to his apostles to perform signs. And number two, that exercising a demon is a sign. It's listed as a miracle or a miraculous sign in scripture. So those who say that we should be able to um, exercise demons today and perform exorcisms, they need to explain why they're also not able to raise the dead, heal the sick, make the blind see, mm -hmm. and walk. Because it's the same kind of miraculous sign. And Jesus gave testimony to that when he said, um, my ability to plunder Satan's kingdom is evidence that I have, I have authority over him. It was a miraculous sign. Thing to exercise a demon. They're exercising demons is classified in scripture as a miraculous sign. Mm -hmm. So we are not supposed to do that today. The way that we handle the demonic, if we do run in to somebody who is demon possessed, which there's no 
ability on our behalf other than some sort of divine revelation or manifestation to know if that's the case or not. But if we were to run into somebody who is demon possessed, the answer is the gospel. That's what they need. Mm -hmm. And the gospel will deliver them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's son. They don't need an exorcism or a power encounter or binding Satan or canceling generational or curses or pleading the blood of Jesus or anything like that. What they need is the gospel. They need to understand that they're lost and, and have the gospel communicated to them. And, and if God will use the power of the gospel itself to set them free, then that freedom from sin that the gospel mm -hmm. accomplishes will also be a freedom from the demonic realm. So share the gospel. Yeah, the gospel is the answer mm -hmm. for de demonic possession. Okay. And Christians cannot be demon possessed. So once somebody is a believer, they cannot be possessed by a demon. Because the we Holy are not Spirit called, is indwelling. Yeah, we are not called to do perform exorcisms. There's mm -hmm. no instructions in the New Testament to the church to perform exorcisms. Not one. You can read through the epistles in vain. You'll never see Paul calling for an exorcism. Uh, even in the midst of rampant sin in the church, mm -hmm. it was church discipline that was necessary. It was right. sanctification that was necessary, but not an exorcism. So true. there's no command. There's no instructions to Christians to exercise demons. So we, we can't have a demon inside of us but we, because we have the Holy Spirit within us, but we yeah. could be uh, oppressed or bothered by demons. Yeah, I, I, think that, I think demons can uh, torment us. That's not mm -hmm. exactly the word I'm looking for, but you know, they can. we can be attacked. Um, yeah. We can be spiritually attacked by demons, but they can only touch us to the extent that God allows them to. And, and we learn that from right. Job. Uh, really, the devil is God's devil. It's on a leash right now until mm -hmm. the Lord casts him into the lake of fire. So Satan can only go so far, and but he cannot indwell us, and he cannot he cannot possess us, and uh, he cannot control us from the inside, though he can attack us and make our lives miserable from the outside. What do you and, think about C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters where he has demons affecting the thoughts of Christians? It, it's great fiction. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I I've listened to this, I've listened to that audio book. I've read the book a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I enjoy I enjoy screw tape letters as a how would I say it? I, I enjoy the screw tape letters kind of as a fictional representation of the wiles of the devil. Okay. I wouldn't I wouldn't classify it obviously as a manual. I think that Lewis had had keen insight as a Christian thinker into exactly what it is that Satan wants to do mm -hmm. and how he can sometimes trick us. Whether or not Satan can cause me to think of something by putting thoughts into my head, I would be tempted to say, no, I don't think mm -hmm. that he can do that. Mm -hmm. But I do think that being a 6,000 year student of human history and human nature, that Satan can probably create circumstances in which he can cause me to think a certain thing because he mm -hmm. knows how I'm likely to respond to something. That's right. So if, if he wants me to lust, he can parade some scantily clad woman in front of me knowing that my human nature and my mind is probably going to think something before I have a chance to even stop it. Mm -hmm. Or if he wants me to doubt, he probably knows exactly what kind of a circumstance could, could cause that to happen. Um, so I think he's a, a good student of whether he's writing the thoughts and, and injecting them into my brain and making me think them from mm -hmm. the outside. Um, I don't think so. I think mm -hmm. that he simply knows how to best deceive us and to trick mm -hmm. us. And he knows how human beings think. And Definitely. so the way that he causes us to think certain thoughts is probably external by arranging circumstances in which we are likely to behave or respond in a certain way. Part of the temptation that he does to people. Yeah. Because he does tempt humans to sin. And, yes. And now, correct me if I'm wrong, Pastor, the cycle that I've been uh, aware of in my own processes and people I've worked with and have read about, if this is biblical or not, is that Satan will kind of coax you into sinning saying oh it'll be so so good it won't matter you you know that you deserve this you know go go do this sin and then you engage in it and then satan kind of pounces on you with worldly sorrow saying oh see not god will never love you yeah. you're no good and kind of this vicious cycle yeah is is that scriptural uh i, I think it's whether you could grab a passage of scripture that that um would spell that out exactly. I don't, I can't think of one off the top of my okay. head. Uh -huh. It certainly seems as if it is a, probably a common experience it does. where he does tempt us. We know that he is mm -hmm. the tempter. Right. He is seeking someone to devour. He, he, he would destroy us all if he could. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, th I think that he is after us in that sense. He, he loves the downfall of Christians. Yeah. And then of course, when we sin in a certain way, there is the accuser of the brethren who That's stands true. there day and night to accuse us. And, and I think that we get a sense of that. And our, of course, we want to make sure that 
when we sin, when we fall, that we respond biblically with godly sorrow, godly mm-hmm. repentance, and not right. worldly sorrow. Yep. Um, he certainly would be, as the one who orchestrates the entire world system, he certainly knows exactly what it was that would cause a worldly sorrow. And so mm-hmm. he, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he is, he is able to manufacture that and create that in the lives of Christians. And it, it is a way of keeping us from really dealing with sin as we should, which is godly sorrow and repentance and mortifying it and putting it to death. I love it. Mortifying sin reminds me of John Owen too. I've got yeah. a book of his about mortifying sin. That's very- I borrowed the language from him. Okay. Yeah. I love his work. Um, and, and so let I hope you don't mind all these questions. I'm just no, not at all. throwing them at you. Um, so there's a very popular movie, which I actually, uh-huh. I actually enjoy called the war room. And there's this famous scene where Patricia Shear is going out in her patio, her, her husband's about to cheat on her. Uh, her life's kind of falling apart. She's been working with this woman named Miss Clara, who's taught her to turn to scripture. And so in this famous scene, Patricia Shear is confronting the devil directly. And, he, and she's saying, you have no right to my marriage. Get out of my life. And so she's directly rebuking the devil. And this is something that you see recommended a lot is for, for Christians to say, get, it, get there behind me, Satan. And and, and such. Yeah. And so could you speak about whether Christians are supposed to directly rebuke the devil or the demons? Yeah, there's kind of an assumption behind that practice or that idea um, that I think is unbiblical. And the assumption is that because we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places, that we have all the authority that Christ has. And though we are seated with him positionally, that doesn't mean that we have the same degree or type of authority that he has to control the demonic realm or to control nature, etc. Um, with that, that, that authority does not belong to us. That authority is his and his alone. And though we are, though we are with him by virtue of our salvation in terms of, of our, our position with him in righteousness before God, having our sins forgiven, being cleansed of that, we don't possess the authority over the spiritual realm to control demons or to, to command them. That is that whole notion of commanding demons and rebuking them and reproving them and stuff. That is, that is the stuff that, uh, as Peter and Jude says, are the marks of a false teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, it is that reviling of angelic authorities where you, you speak evil of angelic authorities. And, and Peter and Jude say, uh, these people, they do like unreasoning beasts, knowing not what they speak of. And Michael did not Archangel bring up Michael, a right. against Satan over the body of Moses. But he said, may the Lord rebuke you. And I think that that's all a Christian can say is, Lord, please rebuke Satan or, or keep mm-hmm. him away from me. Um, to, for us to stand up as if we have this authority and we're going to speak evil of, of spiritual dignitaries, I think is, is arrogant, presumptuous, and um, really speaks to an ignorance that we have of exactly what it is that we're dealing with. We are out of our depth when we start doing that, because that is not for us to do. Our job is to stand in Ephesians 6, the language of Ephesians 6. We're not supposed to um, reprove and rebuke devils and, and do hand-to-hand combat. We're simply to stand in what has been provided, the salvation that's been provided for us. Oh, man. I just feel like applauding when <laughs> someone says this because I think it's so dangerous for people to, and like you said, arrogant to think that we yeah. can talk directly to the devil. It is the mark of a false teacher. You, you turn on TBN on any day that ends in Y and you'll see Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland and uh, Morris Sorello and Robert Tilton and the whole cast of cavalcade of, of charlatans and clowns uh, masquerading as Christians doing this very thing, rebuking demons and rebuking spirits and, casting them out, et cetera. And the, the pride and arrogance that is evident there is exactly what Peter in Second Peter and Jude in his book described in the New Testament, that arrogant, that arrogant pride that manifests itself in a pursuit of money and sensual pleasures, but also in a reviling spirit toward angelic authorities, particularly mm-hmm. Satan and his demons. Mm-hmm. And uh, we just do not have that authority, and, and, and it's overstepping our bounds when we think we can do that. Thank you. Speaking of that, um, in the New Age and kind of borrowing from Roman Catholicism was this belief that we could invoke angels, particularly Archangel Michael, to cast out the devil. Or in, We didn't use the word devil in the New Age. It was all about negativity or negative energy. And, yeah. and so what about Archangel Michael? Uh, well, he, he, I would say he's a servant of God, and um, he's not Jesus. Uh, right. like the Jehovah's Witnesses would teach. He is a servant of God. He is um, one of God's messenger angels. 
And the um, what we see in Scripture is that he does do spiritual warfare. Uh, he is battling Satan. There is some sort of an, an epic spiritual battle going on in the heavenly places. Um, we are not involved in it in a Frank Peretti sense of piercing the darkness in this present darkness, um, but we are involved in it in the sense that we are at, we are fighting back against the lies that the enemy spreads as we as we promote the truth and preach the truth. So um, Michael is our ally, but we are we're not we don't give him power by what we pray or by what we do or by what we say. And we don't have authority to invoke him. Uh, no, I don't. I don't see anywhere in Scripture where anybody did that Paul or Peter or anybody else and and if anybody ever had the ability to invoke an angel or to command an angel a good angel it probably would have been an apostle mm -hmm. and I'm not one of those and nobody watching this is one of those uh, so if we don't we don't have any biblical precedent or command or example of doing that anywhere in scripture that's right when he when he approached Daniel it wasn't Daniel's bidding it was no, Daniel didn't even know this was going on That's right. until until Michael revealed that to him, until it was revealed to him by the angel. Daniel Daniel wasn't praying in that regard. He was praying about something else. Mm -hmm. uh, it was later after he was praying that he even found out that this was the reason for the delay. So Daniel was not invoking or calling upon angels for help. He was praying to, to his God, and uh, angels were the means by which God was answering the prayers at that time, which is a biblical thing and God is still free of course to use angels to answer prayers of his people mm -hmm. um, because they are ministering spirits sent out to minister to those who will inherit salvation which is us so God still uses angels but he uses angels by his own sovereign will probably in response to the things that we pray but not because we are invoking angels or commanding angels or naming them and calling them to our side in some way Thank you. This is so refreshing to hear you speak this truth. I mean, again, this book, uh, Truth or Territory, is, is such a treasure trove. This is one of the books you want to read once a year. And I have read so many books on spiritual warfare because I was suffering from it. And most of the books that I ever read, I, th I threw in the trash. I, I have one from Warren Wiersbe. Um, mm. that's, that's called The Strategy of Satan. And it's just what the Bible says. And it's a tiny yeah. book. And so your book um, was highly recommended to me by people I respect as one of the few spiritual warfare books that is steeped in scripture and, and also goes into what is not scriptural. And, and so we've been talking about uh, praying the blood of Jesus over people and over things and, and rebuking the devil and such. And so obviously none of these do work. I'm a living testimony that they didn't work for me. Uh, and yeah. we've talked about what does work is immersing yourself in scripture in Ephesians 6. And, yeah. and so um, in your book, you are so clear in delineating the three sources of what we call spiritual warfare. We've gone into one, and that's the rulers and powers and authorities, the, the fallen angels. Uh, we've touched a little bit on the fleshly nature where you're going to have these temptations to kind of your fallback sin. And then the third one, let's talk about this. This is the worldly influence that we might think is actually coming from the devil, but it, it is in a roundabout way because he's the God of this world. But mm -hmm. what about the worldly influences? Yeah, the world, uh, I talk in the book about a three front war that we're fighting the world, the flesh and the devil. Um, and of course the flesh is the, in, the interior enemy. It's the enemy within that wants to subvert all sanctification process and, and love love the world and love the, the devil's teaching and the lies, etc. cetera. Um, that is a battle we have to fight, a fight. And we fight each battle differently, as it were. The, uh, the world is the world system, which is allied against God and his truth. So it, it, does, the, it does the devil's bidding in the, in the same way that um, a radio tower does the bidding of its station manager. It broadcasts a certain signal, and we're constantly bombarded by this worldly signal all around us through media, through academia, through culture, uh, higher education, um, the advertisements, our television sets, the sports venues, every, everywhere we look, we are bombarded by worldly, godless thinking. And worldliness, the world system, is basically the system that leaves God out. It's the system that says, I'll, I'll go to this such and such a city tomorrow, I'll buy and sell, make millions, come back, um, I'll build bigger barns, I will plan my life accordingly, I will, I will live without giving God second thought, I will keep my priorities mine, I will live according to my own, the dictates of my own conscience or my own desires. It's just a way of handling life, a way of living life and a way of approaching, it's a worldview, it's a way of approaching reality that gives no consideration to God or his truth. It says if God's word doesn't matter, 
and God's truth doesn't matter and God's not even in the picture. That's the heart of worldly thinking. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily a, a certain philosophy uh, because every philosophy that leaves God out, no matter, no matter what type of it, philosophy it is, stoicism or nihilism or, or any kind of ism or a false religion or false cult, all of that would be worldliness because it, it makes no room for the truth of the real God, the one true and living God in its worldview and its mentality. So we are fighting against the world in the sense that we have to resist its temptations and we have to be immersed in scripture so that our minds are renewed according to the word of God and not the spirit of the age. Uh, we need to be aware and alert of what type of spiritual movements are afoot around us in the, in the worldliness around us right now. We're, you know, in the midst of progressivism, which is the spirit of the age, a, a, a radical anti-God uh, push in our culture, in our government, in our media, in our academia. You see it all around you. We need to be aware that these things are going on mm -hmm. and, and constantly be asking, how does the truth of God answer this worldly philosophy, this way of thinking that is an ideology? It's a, it's a worldview in which people are held up in their minds. They are, they're held captive by these worldly, godless ideologies in their mind. And as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, our job is to take the truth of that and to crush those worldly ideologies and worldliness with the truth of God's word so that we might set men free from the mental, mental fortresses that they are held up in mm -hmm. um, and where they're kept uh, a hostage from by the God of this world uh, in, these mental, in these mental fortresses. So that's, that's our goal with spiritual warfare is really to attack that worldly ideology with the truth of God to, in order to set men free. And that's where gospel proclamation and truthful proclamation of the truth come into, come into play. Do you think it's wise to avoid secular influences then, you know, stay away from secular movies or such? Uh, I think it can be depending on the mm -hmm. source. I don't think that everything that's produced by the world is, is evil. You know, if we were to stay out of that, we'd have to take ourselves out of the world. So, right. you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say that I have a TV and I enjoy football and, mm -hmm. and I enjoy sporting events and I, I enjoy things that are not necessarily um, you know, overtly spiritual. Mm -hmm. I enjoy uh, music that's not performed by Christians necessarily, but we need to be aware of what is behind the, the, the behind the mess, the medium, mm -hmm. the message behind the medium. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's nothing inherently sinful. I don't think about watching a football game. Mm -hmm. There is something inherently sinful about watching the Super Bowl halftime show. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, so those are, th those are different mediums and different right. messages. Um, so I, I think that we can make use of the things of this world, but we need to be aware that some things can open us up to being deceived. Some things can, can begin to influence how we think and how we, how we view sin and how we view others. And we need to be aware that the devil is constantly coming at us through all of these different venues. Um, you know, if you, if you sat down and all you did was imbibe on worldly philosophy constantly, I think you would be setting yourself up for, for a spiritual handicap and, and, um, so we just need to be aware of what the mm -hmm. worldliness is and the ways in which it comes at us. Being aware is key and being honest with yourself and with God. Yeah. Yeah. So what, someone asked me to ask you <laughs> this question. Don't be afraid. It's an easy question. That's right. Uh, is there anything that you would add to truth or territory now um, after it has oh. been published for a while now? I, that, that's a good question. I, I've had a couple of questions asked in email that I have responded to an email and I'm sort of collecting some FAQs that I may, and some future point add to the back of the book oh, okay. kind of as, a, as an addendum at a future edition or version. Well, I may just put them on the website. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I, I can't think of anything that I left out. Mm -hmm. I tried to be as thorough as I can in handling some of those false theologies and ideologies and trying to present what true biblical warfare is. Let me just, let me just read a couple quotes from your book, if you don't mind. Okay. <laughs> Embarrass no. you here. Okay. Uh, I love this on page 151. A matchless Messiah or a model for ministry. It is assumed by modern deliverance ministry leaders and advocates that if something was done by Jesus, it was intended to be a model for us. It is assumed that if this is characterized in the ministry of Jesus and the apostles, it should likewise characterize the gospel ministry of believers individually and the church corporately in all ages. But that's not true, is it? Just because Jesus did it. it as you said, it was pointing to his divinity. Yeah, Jesus, uh, in order to make, 
in order to prove the messianic claims that he made in that first century context, uh, he had to do certain things that were intended to be unique one-time events. Um, giving sight to the blind, for instance, is a unique messianic sign, uh, not one that the apostles duplicated. It was, it was a unique thing that pointed directly to him as the Messiah, who would bring light to the Gentiles and who would make the blind to see. These were prophecies of the Old Testament. And that's giving sight to the blind is not something that we're called to go out into the streets and do. Feeding the 5,000, the multitudes with the fish and the bread, um, these unique miracles that Jesus did, they authenticated his claims. They were evidence that he was the Messiah of Israel. And there's no indication that what he, was, what he did was intended to be duplicated by us. Mm -hmm. Just because scripture describes something doesn't mean it prescribes something. So That's right. if it describes Jesus's life and ministry, the things that he did, it doesn't prescribe the same thing for us as if we are to model. We're not to go out and die on a cross. Mm -hmm. That's not how all of us are called to die. It was something that was unique to his calling. And yet when people look at the life of Jesus, they, they don't say, well, we should be going out and dying on crosses because Jesus did it. So therefore we should be doing it. We should be dying for the sins of humanity. No, that was something unique to his person, his calling and his office and his role that he plays in God's redemptive program. And, but yet that ability to discern between what is described and prescribed in terms of the cross, people get that. But in terms of the other miracles and things that Jesus did, they, that all of a sudden that discernment, that distinction goes out the window for people and it shouldn't. That's true. So much false teaching comes from cherry picking bits and pieces of scripture and twisting. And not understanding context. why certain things are, are recorded for us. That's right. Yeah. So your book is just chock full of what we need today <laughs> to, to ground us in scripture and get us away from declaring and decreeing and binding and loosening and, and putting all the onus on ourselves when we should be utilizing what the Bible gives us. And that's prayer, you know, going yeah. to God and saying, I need help with this father. <laughs> right. Yep. A humble reliance is a difference, but there's a marked difference between an approach of humble reliance upon God, mortifying sin and standing in the truth and the brash time kind of beating your chest, pounding on hell's, hell's gates, thinking that you're going to take on uh, every demon and his hordes. Um, that those are two different approaches to spiritual warfare, and, and I, I commend the first. Oh, man. Well, thank you for being a, a breath of fresh air and for reminding us of biblical truth today. And again, studying the Bible is essential. Reading yeah. it, listening to it, and understanding what is biblical and what is not. And, and you know, if you're going to a church where the pastor doesn't have the Bible open, be, ca be careful, you guys, because it's probably human opinions. And yeah. as you, you said in your book, Pastor Jim, that a lot of the uh, deliverance theology, and I put theology in quotes, is based on people's experiences and opinions, not on what God has in his word. Yeah. Or worse yet, the testimony of demons. Um, that is often in the case in many modern deliverance ministry uh, circles. You know, they, they hear a demon testify in a conversation that they have with him about some structure or power or, or plan, and they take this as if it were gospel truth and, and act upon it. How do you, I, that doesn't even make any sense, a demon's testimony. So they're imagining that the demon's talking to them? and. Uh, no, like uh, in, in one point in the book, I don't even remember this or not, mm -hmm. it was um, in, in the chapter on territorial spirits where uh, C. Peter Wagner talks about um, interviewing uh, uh, spiritualists who interview demons to find out the spiritual structure in the heavenlies and certain demons exercising authority over certain countries. Uh, that's the type of yes. stuff that we're talking about. Or they're involved in an exorcism. Bob, mm -hmm. Bob Larson does supposedly does these exorcisms where he has these long drawn out conversations with demons where he mm -hmm. beats the truth out of them and interviews them and asks them about their cohorts and other demons who might be in this person and all that stuff. And, and they, they act upon this information that mm -hmm. is gleaned from people who are allegedly possessed and, and uh, from the spiritual realm. It's, it's not that they're leaning on scripture or gleaning this information from a study of the text. It's uh, they get the testimony of demons and, and they could, they're not as concerned with what scripture says as they are with what latest fresh insight they get mm -hmm. through some interaction they had with the spiritual realm. Oh, so scary. Well, we appreciate you bringing biblical sense to us and to Thank you. this topic. And we hope to have you back on again. You've got another book, The Prosperity of the Wicked. And that's about yeah. the prosperity gospel and word of faith? No, it's not, actually. You would think that it is, um, mm -hmm. but it's not so much about that. That's kind of Justin Peter's uh, bailiwick. He, yes. he tackled 
Um, and Justin wrote the foreword for the Truth of Territory book. Yes, the prosperity of the wicked is a study of Psalm 73, and it an- tries to answer the age-old question, why do the wicked prosper? Oh, okay. Why is it that we find that the people who share the least amount of our worldview and our, our spiritual priorities in common with us are the most prosperous? Why is it that the richest people are the George Soros's of the world mm-hmm. and, and Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg who turn around and use their millions to advance causes that are completely antithetical to the gospel. Mm-hmm. Why does God supposedly give all of this money to these wicked individuals who, who are not born again believers? And the answer to that is in Psalm 73. And the answer might surprise you. And the answer basically is that that money is a judgment. It's not a blessing. Yes. And, uh, it's a judgment of God upon them. And you think, well, I wish God to throw a little judgment my way. Not, not that kind of money. It, yeah, uh, they, not that kind of judgment. There's yeah. an old Jewish proverb that I wish I would have included in that book that says, if you want to think, see what God thinks about money, just look at the people to whom he gives it. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of wisdom in that. And so the, the, the Prosperity of the Wicked, that's a book that is basically a study. It's an exposition. It comes out of a sermon series that I did on Psalm 73, uh, an exposition of that psalm wrestling through that issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, Asaph's feet almost slipped. He almost stumbled until he says, I came into the, the sanctuary of God. Then he saw the end of the wicked. So he contrasts their their current prosperity with their the end, which was being judged by God. Yes. And then Psalm, then Asaph came to the conclusion, the nearness of God is my good. Like I am prosperous, but in a different way. And I get God and that's better than old earthly riches. Mm. So I think that that book, The Prosperity of the Wicked, will encourage you if that's a struggle for you. And it gives you a whole new insight, a whole new perspective, Scripture does, on why is it that the wicked always seem to have the money and the easy life and the comforts and they seem to die at peace without any worry of eternal judgment. And yet as believers, we are often tormented and we suffer affliction in this mm-hmm. world. And we have trouble in this world and we, right. we go without, we're destitute and afflicted and, and yet the wicked prosper. Why is that? Mm-hmm. Psalm 73 and, and my treatment of that tries to answer that question. Thank you. Well, I look forward to diving into this book next. And, oh, I hope uh, you well, enjoy it. And uh, Justin and I did a series of, of uh, television programs. Uh, they're on YouTube at SO4J TV. Uh, that's sold out for Jesus. So SO4J TV on the YouTube channel where we talk about all of these various issues, spending like 30 minutes a piece mm-hmm. on these things. I think it's eight half hour segments that Justin and I did on that subject. So I, uh, I would we'll put the link here in the one. description. Yeah, as well. And a bit, bit more of a thorough explanation of it. Thank you. We'll have links to everything that we've talked about today, including the uh, Justin Peters and Pastor Jim uh, videos and his books where you can buy them. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, giving us this information and everything that you're doing for God's truth. We really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you very much. It's humbling and an honor to be on your program and I appreciate it. Thank you.